Let's start this off with our wonderful program director, Meg Fensel, and she's going to be leading today's presentation. Being here. We, we are in some challenging times here and really appreciate everyone for, uh, for making the time to connect with us. So I just wanna give a few little basics, basic tips for how to use Zoom. So one important thing is to know how to mute and unmute yourself. The, uh, the host of the meeting who Sibony has control over muting and unmuting. If you have any background noise, uh, it's really important to keep yourself muted and generally just a best practice to stay muted unless you're actively speaking. So to do that, you can hover over the picture of yourself and a, a little microphone should appear and that can allow you to toggle on and off the muting of yourself. You can also raise your hand if you go to the bottom of the screen and, and click hover over uh, participants, you'll see an option to raise your hand. You can use the chat box, which is at the bottom of the screen. This is a great way to ask a question or make a comment. And even if we can't get to all of the comments and questions during this workshop, we can follow up with you afterwards and we'll be sharing a transcript of the chat box with everybody who has been able to participate. So that, that pretty much takes care of all the logistics. We also will follow up with you by tomorrow. We'll send you a recording link of the workshop and we'll also send you that uh, tra chat transcript. So I just wanna recognize the, the situation that we're all in currently. And you may be thinking that it's a strange time to be talking about transportation when most of us are working from home. We certainly have essential workers who are out there and they are very, reliant on the different forms of transportation that they have available to them, whether they have a car, whether they're riding public transit or walking or biking to work, it's really important that they be able to get to and from those jobs. And, and for people who may not be essential workers, but who still need to get to the grocery store or get to a, a critical doctor's appointment, they shouldn't be riding transit if they uh, possibly have a virus, but um, if people need to get out to get to other medical appointments, it's really important that we have a strong transportation system. As we start to think about how Charlotte will recover from COVID-19, we know that a lot of people are facing economic challenges. Many people have lost their jobs. They need to find new jobs when the economy recovers. And they may also not be able to afford the expense of owning a car and maintaining a car. So it's really incredibly important that we have this conversation about transportation and how it's related to our freedom. So I'm going to share my screen and move us over to the presentation. Okay, so you should be able to see the slides now. The, t the term transportation is freedom was coined by a uh, transportation planner, Jarrett Walker, and he does a lot of work around fast, frequent transit networks, buses and, and light rail. But really, when we think about freedom, where you, where you can go is what you can do. So the size of a person's world is really limited by the transportation choices that they have available to them. So if you own a car, you have a pretty big world that you can easily access. If you ride the bus, you, you can get as far as you can get on the bus system. And you're also constrained by the time of day that the buses run and how far they each go to different parts of town and the different types of connections that allow you to transfer between the, the bus or the transit system. Similarly, if you walk or you ride a bicycle, where you can go and what you can do is constrained by the safety of your ability to walk and bike as well as the infrastructure that's available. So I wanna give us an overview today of how we're doing with the relationship between transportation and freedom here in Charlotte. How did we get into this current situation and how we can do better? So if you were at our, our last Grow Smart event on March 11th, you will recognize that some of these slides are similar. And that presentation was very focused on public transit and how we can build a fast, frequent, reliable public transit network to increase people's access to freedom. So this conversation is broader. It's about walking and biking and public transit. Let's see. Oh. 
okay, sorry, the slide didn't advance and then it, a few slides advanced all at once. As you may have heard, economic mobility is a major challenge in many parts of the United States. This is a map of economic mobility across the United States. So what you can see in the legend is different percentages. These are percentages that a child who is born into the lowest one-fifth of the income bracket will reach the top one-fifth of the income bracket during their lifetime. And one pattern that is very stark is that the southeastern United States is a very challenging area for economic mobility of children born into poverty. And we believe that much of that is related to the physical environment in the southeastern United States and our very auto-dominated auto culture that has created a lot of physical barriers to opportunity. In fact, Charlotte ranks dead last. We are 50th among the 50 largest US cities for children born into poverty, economic mobility of children born into poverty. And Charlotte is, is often described as a, a city that has two sides. We have very stark economic inequality and it's, it's really split along uh, rach, racial and geographic lines. So we have a lot of very low income people. We also have a very, a, a very uh, large percentage of people who make very high incomes. In Charlotte, there's about 109,800 people below poverty as of 2018, and that's a poverty rate of about 12.8%. I just wanna show you a series of maps that show how the geographic distribution of poverty has changed in Charlotte since the 1970s. So what you can see in the legend there is the dark green areas are areas with very low percentage of households living in poverty. And then as you move into the yellow and the orange and the red, that those are higher concentrations of poverty. So we're gonna look in 10 year increments and see how this pattern has changed. So this is 1970, this is 1980, 1990, you see this pattern of the poverty starting to spread outwards from Center City. 2000, it's spreading outwards more. By 2012, there's a very dramatic shift. And this 2012 uh, is, is the map where you really start to see the crescent and the wedge pattern emerge. You may have heard of the crescent and the wedge. The crescent of Charlotte runs from west to north to east, and it's generally an area with lower household incomes. And along with that, there are many other quality of life indicators that are much lower in the crescent versus in the wedge of South Charlotte. And by 2017, that pattern has become even more pronounced. So the reason this, that this is important is there is a single strongest predictor of whether a family escapes poverty that's very closely tied to transportation, and that is commute time. So the same study that found that Charlotte ranks last among the largest U.S. cities for economic mobility of children born into poverty also found that the single strongest predictor of whether a family escapes poverty is commute time. So here's why this is important. This is a map from the Enrix drive time dashboard, and it shows you that at 7.10 in the morning, this is how far you could get if you got in your car in Center City, Charlotte, right, right there in the middle of the map, and you drove for outwards for 30 minutes in either direction, which is that darkest blue, or 45 minutes, which is the medium blue, or 60 minutes, which is the lightest blue. So you can see that depending on which direction you're going, you could get farther in some directions by car than in other directions due to both the road network as well as traffic congestion patterns. But if you have a car and you live in Charlotte, you can get pretty far even just in 35, sorry, 30, 45 or 60 minutes. The challenge is that many Charlotteans can't afford cars. 22% of our household income for the median income household in Charlotte, 22% of household income is spent on transportation and 29% on housing. So that means that the two highest household costs add up to 51% of take home pay in Charlotte. And that results in many families being cost burdened by the expenses rent or mortgage plus transportation. The recommendation is that those two expenses should not exceed 45% of income, but here in Charlotte, they, they are 51% for the median income household. And as we're seeing when we face the situation with COVID-19, if our household budget becomes constrained, we um, often 
uh, are really, really challenged and, and cost burdened even more. Even when we don't have that transportation expense, there still might be that car payment, for example, that doesn't go away just because you can't leave home. Um, and so this is the situation for somebody who doesn't have a car, whether they can't afford a car, whether they're unable to drive for any reason, or whether they prefer not to drive. This is a map from the CNT Urban Opportunity Agenda, and it shows you the transit access for entry level jobs that require an associate's degree or less. So if you picture where you live on this map, so just take a moment and think about where you live on this map and drop a pin there in your mind, the color of that, of where that pin is, shows you how many jobs you could get to on a 30 minute transit ride. So if you live along the blue line, you see a lot of green along there. So that corresponds to about 115,000 entry level jobs that you could access within a 30 minute transit ride. If you live in the outer parts of Mecklenburg County or even some parts of, of South Charlotte, you would essentially be living in a, a area that is a jobs desert in terms of jobs that are accessible by public transit. So when we combine the inaffordability of owning a car for many people with the physical reality that our transit network doesn't necessarily cover all parts of our county, that really shows us where some of the gaps are in our, in our access to opportunity, but it also shows us where the gaps are in our, our personal freedom because everywhere that you see red on here, even though that's showing you access to jobs, it's also what really, it's a, pro a proxy for access to opportunities. And just to compound that even further, we have a growing problem with traffic congestion in Charlotte. So whether you're driving or riding the bus, you are facing traffic congestion. We are the 24th most congested city in the country and the 128th most congested in the world. Just last year, drivers in Charlotte spent 49 hours wasted in congestion. So that, was, that wasn't time driving. That was just the difference between free flowing traffic conditions and congested traffic conditions. And that, that caused an estimated $725 per driver in wasted time. And so when we think about solutions for congestion, one of the solutions that sometimes comes up is, you know, electric cars, autonomous vehicles. And while those are potential solutions for improving our air quality and allowing cars to maybe more efficiently use street space in some ways, it doesn't solve the physical geometry of being in a car. So whether you're in a conventional gas powered car or an electric car or an autonomous car, what this figure is showing you is that those vehicles still are not very efficient in the use of street space because they still take up space on the street. They still need to have space between them when they move. But conversely, when we look at different modes of transportation, we can see that the space that is required to move 60 people on a bus or 60 people by bicycle is much, much more efficient than the amount of street space that's required to move 60 people who are driving alone in their own cars. And as we work towards making it safer for people to walk and bike, we really do need to recognize that it is our most vulnerable residents who are at greatest risk when they are walking and biking. Certainly when, whenever any of us is out there walking and biking or getting to and from the transit stops, we are vulnerable because we are uh, not enclosed in a, a car. So there are many parts of Charlotte that look like this where we have very busy streets and we have sidewalks that are back of curb sidewalks where you're walking right next to the car or places where development has occurred in one area and there might be a great sidewalk with a good vegetated uh, buffer between you and the street, but then that sidewalk ends because the next parcel of land up from that hasn't been developed. So Charlotte is really still a pretty challenging place to walk and bike. This data is from Charlotte DOT and it just visually shows you why pedestrians and cyclists are the most vulnerable users of the streets. People walking and biking are involved in less than 3% of all the crashes. So that's what you see on the left there. It's less than 1% cycling, less than one, slightly less than 2% um, walking. But what, we, what you see on the right is that cyclists and pedestrians account for nearly one third of all traffic deaths in Charlotte. So there's a, a, a sort of a disparity there between the 
percentage of cyclists and pedestrians involved in crashes and how many of them end up dying as a result of those crashes. We are very, we're, again, we are just very vulnerable when we walk and bike. So we are talking about ways to make it safer and more convenient to walk and bike and ride public transit. Furthermore, speed is a huge factor. The way that our streets are designed really has an impact on how safe people are and how safe people feel. So if a person were hit by a car at 20 miles per hour, they have a 90% chance of surviving. If they're hit by a car at 40 miles per hour, they have a, only a 20% chance of surviving. And I've even seen it as low as 10%. And of course, those are just, those are national averages. So every circumstance is different. We also want to look at disparities and inequities in the ease of walking and biking. We know that older adults are disproportionately re represented in deaths of people walking. This is national data in this and the next two slides from Dangerous by Design by Smart Growth America. So what you can see here is these older adults, you have a 50 plus population, a 65 plus population, a 75 plus population, and you can see that the fatality rate is increasing. So our older residents are, are definitely the most vulnerable. Also, people of color are disproportionately represented in fatal crashes when they're walking. And in general, people who are walking in low income communities have higher rates of fatality. So you see on the X axis there, household incomes, uh, median household incomes and census tracts. The pedestrian fatality rates are significantly higher in the three to 36,000 per year median household income versus the 79,000 to 250,000 per year. So hopefully that wasn't uh, too sad, but also we, we do want to recognize that those are the current conditions out there for uh, many of our, our essential workers, our community elders, our children, people of color, people living in low income communities. So we, it's really important that we don't just think that all of Charlotte has equal conditions for, for walking and biking. So knowing that, what if we instead valued walking, biking, and transit as freedom, and as a community, we invested in those modes of transportation as much or even more so as the community invests in car infrastructure. So I wanna take a little bit of time here to, to do an interactive exercise. I'm gonna have you take a look at your own transportation choices. So you can type in the chat two different things. One is what is your main mode of transportation? So, you know, on a given day, what is, you know, if you go to work, what is the main way that you get to work? If you go to school, what's the main way you get to school? Uh, you know, if you're retired or you work from home, what is your, your usual way of getting around? Whether that's, you know, walking, biking, public transit, carpooling, Uber, Lyft, uh, whatever that is, just let us know with number one in the chat there. And then number two, what, if anything, makes it difficult for you to walk, bike, or ride public transit? So it may, if, it may be that you live in a part of town where it's pretty easy for you to get to and from your job or your daily needs by different types of transportation. But if it's not, we want to hear about what some of those challenges are. And Sibony is going to share a few of those responses with all of us as you all are typing them in. If we don't get to yours or you just take a little bit longer to type it, that's completely fine because we will be compiling all of these and sharing them when we send out the follow-up email tomorrow. So we have from Dustin, biking as means of transportation. That's wonderful. We have a lot of car. We have from John, walking. Mm -hmm. James has car with some bike. Dustin's transit difficulty, infrequent bus service. That's also an issue where I'm living as well. Sarah Ann, time inconvenience, location for walking, biking, transit, too many places. Eric, for the first question, he uses all modes, walk, transit, bike, scooter, and car. You go, Eric. Yes. Okay, well, thanks so much, Sibini. And like I said, we'll capture all of your responses. Appreciate your sharing. So what, what I heard in there, a lot of people um, are, are driving. So, you know, 
fully recognize Charlotte is, is often pretty difficult to get around without a car. I also hear that a lot of people are, are using different modes of transportation, maybe depending on where they need to go and what they need to do. Maybe a quick trip to the grocery store to pick up a loaf of bread you could do on a bike, uh, but maybe, you know, a trip across town would require a car. Uh, we're going to be doing some workshops over the next couple weeks to really explore some of these different modes of transportation in more detail. So we'll be looking at walking and biking and public transit and really, really narrowing down on, on what some of the opportunities are there, as well as, as some of the, the ongoing barriers. So thank you all so much for participating in that little chat input exercise. So before we talk about some solutions, let's briefly talk about how we got into this situation. Charlotte is a very, very sprawling community. We're really spread out. And that largely results is a result of most of our population growth happening after cars were invented. So we're just a city that's really built on a car auto dominated scale rather than a scale for people to, to walk and, and bike. The rise of the suburbs happened after World War II. So there was a lot of GIs that were returning from the war. People were wanting to start families and there was a desire for people to live sort of out in the country, but not way out in the country. And so the, the suburbs really arose as, as part of the new American dream where everybody could have you know, a quarter acre of land or so and a, a house that uh, had some of the benefits of being in a city, but also some of the benefits of being out in the country. So it was a huge, massive uh, social experience, experiment. Um, to further compound some of the segregation that had already happened, there was a lot of redlining and racial inequity that resulted from that. So essentially, banks would, would draw, literally draw on maps, they would draw red lines and shade them in around areas that were considered undesirable to give loans to. And not surprisingly, those were largely communities of color. So despite all of the, the wealth that came out of the GI Bill, many people of color did not participate, they were not able to participate in that generational building of wealth because of policies like redlining, because of policies like not being uh, uh, permitted to enroll in, in different colleges. So we started to see a lot of that inequity transferring over to the built environment. Also around this time, we really fell in love with cars and, and uh, cars began to become affordable to many people and that further shaped the, the built environment and how we travel around. Also, the design of the streets themselves began to change over the decades. So th this, these are some images of how the street patterns changed between 1900 and 1980. So back in 1900, most, most cities were laid out in a grid-like pattern and it was very easy to get from one part of that network to another because there were multiple ways you could get around. As the suburbs grew and people wanted more and more privacy, we started to see a uh, shifting and a warping of those street networks. And eventually there were more cul-de-sacs and cul-de-sacs are really terrible for connectivity. And here's a little schematic that shows you why. So the dot at the center of these circles is a theoretical transit stop and the circle around it is a quarter mile radius. So the whole air, that whole area is a quarter mile, but really only the black shaded streets are within a quarter mile walk. So on the top, you see a very walkable community and one where it would be easy to get around walking, biking, having transit stops on, on different streets. And if you lived on any of those streets, you could pretty easily get to that transit stop. But in the bottom here, you can see how challenging it would be to get to different parts of the street network. Some of them are, are completely inaccessible by the street network, despite being within that quarter mile radius. And then we also have to think about the challenge of crossing those streets. So not only can you not physically get to different parts of that quarter mile radius, but you also need to be able to cross the street, which may be very busy with traffic. And so what we have a lot of in Charlotte is, this is a sort of a worst case scenario, but we have these very, very auto dominated streets with very, very auto dominated uses, a lot of drive throughs, a lot of um, storage units, um, just a lot of, of uses that are not really conducive to people walking and biking and riding transit. So what's the solution? We at Sustain Charlotte are, are working towards a smart growth solution. This is what we advocate for. This is an image that shows a smart growth community. So this is where people have access to their daily needs without having to drive. So they, the community is built on a human scale you can get where you need to go by bicycle, by streetcar or light rail or bus, by walking. 
And a simple definition is that smart growth is an approach to development that encourages a few things, a mix of building types and uses, diverse housing and transportation options, development within existing neighborhoods and community engagement. And there are 10 elements of smart growth I'll just go through quickly. One of them is to mix land uses. So this is an example from the Metropolitan in Charlotte where you have restaurants and retail together. You take advantage of compact design. So this is that same area. Instead of having your Staples and your Marshalls and your Best Buy laid out in a strip mall with a big parking lot between them and having to drive between them, you can take advantage of that compact design to, to stack them on top of each other. And that's a much more efficient use of the street space. It makes it much more walkable. Smart growth also creates a range of housing opportunities and choices. So people at different income levels, different stages of life, different ability levels need different types of houses. So we're not advocating for everybody necessarily to live in a high rise apartment if that's what you like to do. Um, and that's something that you can afford that that might work for you. We also recognize that, you know, duplexes and, and triplexes and accessory dwelling units are a really important part of the solution. And Charlotte needs those solutions so that people will have places that they can afford to live, but that aren't so far out into the suburbs that they have no hope of, of accessing opportunities without a car. Smart growth also creates walkable neighborhoods and to have a walkable community, you need those mixed land uses. You need that higher density, the connected street networks rich physical activity resources, and just a lot of pedestrian fr friendly design. Smart growth fosters distinctive, attractive communities with a strong sense of place. This is an image from the Monroe Road Advocates. And Monroe Road, if you've been down there, you know it's, it's a pretty auto-oriented road, pretty, pretty challenging to cross, and it has heavy traffic volumes. But the Monroe Road Advocates have worked very hard to create a sense of space along that road and this is their embrace sculpture which serves as a, a centerpiece for the community. Smart growth recognizes that um, despite being dense and walkable communities also need to have natural places where people can gather and en enjoy being outdoors and with each other. I think this is especially poignant right now as, as people are seeking safe ways to be outdoors and get some exercise and connect to nature. Um, many of our most popular greenways and the rail trail have become pretty, pretty crowded with people. Um, so that, I think that, that makes us value those, those natural spaces all the more. And it, it demonstrates the, needs, the need to have a park within walking distance of, of every home versus having parks that people need to drive through. Because now we know that, that the parks have had to close the gates because too many people were not social distancing. So um, the importance of, of green space is, is really essential and very uh, central to uh, smart growth. Smart growth also directs development towards existing communities. So smart growth takes advantage of the infrastructure that's already there instead of creating new infrastructure. Things like sewer and electricity and new streets are incredibly expensive to build and the maintenance costs of those over time are very high. So whenever possible, it, it usually makes sense to direct the development towards existing communities rather than sprawling into a new previously undeveloped area. Smart growth also provides a variety of transportation choices. That's, that's really the, the topic of today's webinar. We know that there's not necessarily a one size fits all mode of transportation that works for every person at every time, but a community that is well designed will be accessible by different types of, of transportation. When we think about how development decisions are made, smart growth is really based on development decisions that are predictable, fair, and cost effective. And that is for both residents and for the developers. And finally, smart growth encourages community and stakeholder collaboration in development decisions. So everybody is, is part of the decision-making process and decisions aren't being made in a vacuum just by, by government staff or developers. So this is an image from one of our youth sustainable transportation fairs at the Arbor Glen Rec Center a few summers ago. And Scott Curry, who's the active transportation coordinator at Charlotte DOT, was at the time developing the uh, very first pedestrian plan for the city of Charlotte. And he actually brought his input boards to that meeting and he valued the input of the youth who were at that event because he recognized that stakeholder uh, engagement is, is not just about people in, in decision-making uh, authority roles. It's also about 
soliciting and creating the people who would use those, those streets and those facilities. So now that we've talked about some of the challenges and how we got there, we want to talk about some ways that you can support smart growth and transportation equity. One of the things that you can do is get more involved in the Charlotte Future 2040 Comprehensive Plan. This is a plan that will really, it'll lay out the city's vision for growth and development and identify opportunities and challenges to achieving that vision. And when this is complete, it will really streamline Charlotte's numerous uh, plans and ordinances into a single easy to use, easy to understand document. So right now, Charlotte has a lot of outdated and, and contradictory ordinances and the comprehensive plan and the U unified development ordinance will bring all of those together in a very coordinated, very easy to understand way so that the vision for how Charlotte will grow will match the reality of how Charlotte grows. So you can um, go to Charlotte charlotteudo.org to get more information about that. I, I believe the public meetings are um, currently on hold as we're, we're all staying on home at home, but I know that the, the, the various task forces involved in moving the comprehensive plan and the unified development ordinance forward are still working hard behind the scenes to make this happen. You can also advocate for neighborhood connectivity. We do a lot of visioning exercises in partnership with neighborhoods where, where they have already uh, mapped out the different assets in their community and we work with them to identify some of the barriers and the opportunities that exist to make their community more connected. We also uh, believe that you can support Vision Zero. Vision Zero is the City of Charlotte's initiative to eliminate traffic fatalities and serious injuries by the year 2030. And we partnered with the West Boulevard Neighborhood Coalition beginning a few years ago and worked with them to, to really advocate for Vision Zero after an 11-year-old girl was hit and killed while crossing West Boulevard. And as a result of that partnership, the City of Charlotte and NCDOT proposed uh, recommended changes that would make West Boulevard more pedestrian and bicycle friendly. And those, are, those uh, recommendations are currently, some of them are complete and some, are, some of them are in the process of being planned and built. You can also support new bike infrastructure. We have been advocating strong for protected bike lanes, which is a vertical barrier between the cyclist and, and drivers, because we know that sometimes in many cases on those higher traffic volume streets, a stripe of paint is not enough to, pay, to make most people feel comfortable riding their bike next to cars. When there's a vertical separation, we see more people of all ages and all ability levels feel comfortable riding a bike. And we partnered with Charlotte DOT on the pilot cycle track on 6th Street, and we're continuing to advocate for the timely completion of that, as well as for a network of cycle tracks or protected bike lanes that are in both Uptown and eventually throughout Charlotte. We partnered with the Plaza Midwood Neighborhood Association and several other neighborhood associations starting a few years ago to make the plaza more bike and pedestrian friendly. It used to be two lanes of travel in either direction. There were a, a disturbing number of uh, incidents of cyclists and pedestrians being hit by cars. And in partnership with those neighbors who really led the effort, that was now transformed just about a month ago uh, to have one lane of travel for cars in either direction and a protected bike lane that has planters to delineate the space between cyclists and people driving. And we were really excited to, to celebrate with Stroll and Roll Plaza Midwood and the neighborhood associations and Charlotte DOT and all of the amazing partners that were involved in that effort. And there was a huge Mardi Gras celebration. Many people came out. And so I love this picture from Stroll and Roll Plaza Midwood because it shows the variety of ages and ability levels and different uses of the streets. You see people walking and riding bikes and riding scooters and pushing strollers. So it's really amazing to see not only what happened that day, but what has been happening since then on that, on that street as more people use the space. We would encourage you just as a really tangible step that you can take to support Vision Zero and to support more space for people to walk and bike safely on our streets. Um, sign our petition. We're asking the City of Charlotte to allocate $50 million for projects that will improve access and safety for people walking and biking, and really also for people walking who ride public transit, because most people who ride public transit are not driving to and from their stops. Most of them are, are getting there on foot or by bike. 
you could also be a champion for public transit. So right now, CATS was, was actually doing their Silver Line public meetings right when the, um, the coronavirus situation hit. So we were fortunate to be able to go to one of the, the last of those and, and hear some of their plans for the Silver Line. But you can go to CATS's website and, and get caught up on, on those meetings virtually. And over the next few months, you'll be hearing more from us as we build out our transit coalition. So we're building a, a, a grassroots network of neighborhoods who really believe that public transit is important. You can also host a walkability or a mobility audit. We've done many of these now in different neighborhoods throughout Charlotte. And it's basically you get your, your uh, neighbors and friends together and you audit the streets. So you, you have a, a clipboard and you document some of the qualitative and quantitative conditions that could make it challenging for a person who's walking in your neighborhood. And then we have some tools that can help you use those results as an advocacy tool to improve your neighborhood. So this is a, a group of residents who were out on a walkability audit with us last year in the North End. And finally, I just want to share some upcoming opportunities with you. Uh, I know many of you have attended our Charlotte Sustainability Awards. We were all set to go for Earth Day, but uh, of course, we're postponing that. We would never cancel it because we're so excited about celebrating all of the great sustainability work being done out in our community. So that's been postponed for September 9th at the Extravaganza uh, Depot. And even though we can't hold the event until September, we have already released the names of our nominees. So you can check those out at sustaincharlotte.org slash awards and join us in celebrating our many amazing nominees. We have a great family-friendly event coming up next week at the same time. It's called Exploring Nature in Your Backyard. And we know that everyone's uh, you know, at home with their kids. So we want you to be able to do something fun and enjoy some nature while you're there. And oftentimes we overlook the amazing things that are happening just in our own backyard. Or if you live in an apartment, you can even do this on your balcony. You'll see things out there. So Alice Chambers from Mecklenburg County Park and Rec will join us as a guest speaker. And she'll be talking to us about the iNaturalist app and how you can use that either with your kids or you don't even have to have kids. I don't have kids, but I'll probably do it myself because it looks really fun. So you can register for that at sustaincharlotte.org slash events. And we'll see you next week on that one. And because Earth Day is still happening, even though we can't meet in person. We invite you to join us for our virtual Earth Day celebration on Wednesday, April 22nd. That is the 50th anniversary of Earth Day at 5 p.m. And we have some fun celebrations planned for you. You can register at sustaincharlotte.org slash events. And not only is it the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, it's also the 10 year anniversary of Sustain Charlotte. So not necessarily to the day, but we're selling, celebrating our 10 year anniversary this year. And we wanted to just wrap, wrap those two together and have a big fantastic celebration until we can see you all in person again. We're also hosting a virtual volunteer social. So you see a lot of virtual on here, but we also look forward to seeing you in person. So a virtual volunteer social on Thursday, April 30th at 12 noon. Um, and you can register also on that same events page. And whether you volunteered with us before or you're just interested in volunteering for the first time, we'd love to see you at that. And we'll have some time just to, to mingle and get to know each other. We'll also talk about some upcoming, upcoming volunteer needs that we'll, we'll have for our events later this year when we do those in person. But we'll also share some opportunities of ways that you can get involved as a volunteer without even leaving your desk. Um, you know, we know that this, this is a challenging time for many people, so um, we don't, don't feel uh, that we're asking you to, to give if your financial situation is, is challenging at this time. But if you are considering giving to Sustain Charlotte, it would be a great time to, to do that. We are still continuing to work here every day. And we have a membership that starts at just $5 a month, and that includes invites to our members-only events, 10% off a leaf burrito, and at partner bike shops. And if you want to do $10 a month, there's a free t-shirt and discounts at our ticketed events. Or if you prefer to do this as part of our Earth Day celebration, you can uh, join us on Earth Day in our fundraiser and help us to hit our goal for that day. So before we do question and answers, I just want to real quickly um, ask you to type into the chat what you, will what you are committing to do to support more equitable transportation for the Charlotte area. So uh, you may already have something in mind. Uh, you know, different ideas are 
um, you know, to maybe, maybe you just go to the Charlotte DOT website and you learn more about Vision Zero so that you can talk to your neighbors about it. Um, maybe you uh, go to our uh, sustaincharlotte.action page and sign our petition. Um, one thing that we would not encourage you to do right now is hop on the bus or light rail and take a ride, even though those are fare free currently. Um, we're really trying to make sure that, that the people who are riding transit now are only those people who are essential workers or who you know need to get to the, the store to get some groceries so it's not the, not the time to, to take your intro ride on on public transit because we want to keep the fellow transit passengers and drivers safe but we look forward to encouraging ridership when the the uh the COVID-19 situation improves so Sibony would you like to share what some people are putting in the chat box definitely so from Jim, he has signed the petition, and Tina has signed the petition, supported Vision Zero, continued promoting bike to work efforts for Bank of America employees through my environment, and Sarah Ann will encourage friends and family to become sustained Charlotte members. Excellent, thank you all so much. You can also share our petition at sustaincharlotte.org. Uh, um, sustaincharlotte.org slash action. You can share that with your uh, friends and family in the, in the Charlotte area. That'd be a great way to help out. Okay, so now we are gonna do some questions and answers. So you can either raise your hand, you can type a question into the chat box and we will, uh, Sibony will, sorry, Sarah Ann will, will call in people to ask their questions. And so when she calls on you, you can go ahead and un unmute yourself to ask your question. I can kick us off with a question of my own. Um, so I'm curious, Meg, um, for those of us that live in areas that are, are difficult currently for, for bike, walk, and transit, um, what would you encourage us to do in, in the here and now? Like, do you think it's really important for us to, to make the time to um, take transit, even though it, it can be exponentially longer than driving by car or relocating to more bike, walk, or transit friendly areas? Um, like what would you encourage for those of us that, that live in areas right, right in the here and now that, that make that really challenging? Yeah, so it's gonna be a different decision for everyone. And you know, some, someone might have kids in school and they can't just easily move to an area that is, is more accessible by public transit. If, the, if somebody decided that they wanted to have a, an easier commute by transit, that would, would certainly be a, a very sustainable choice. Much of Charlotte is, especially in that South Charlotte area where we saw, saw a lot of the transit desert, because the streets are so um, kind of, it's that, that warped uh, pattern that I showed you was happening more in the later 20th century. It's really challenging for cats to, rot, uh, to run high frequency public transit in those areas. So, you know, one thing you might be able to do is use some of the park and rides. I know that there's a park and ride at South Park Mall. And so if that was if that was feasible for your commute and that was closer to your home than driving to work, um, that's something that you might explore. Another thing is that even if your commute work, your commute trip doesn't work by public transit, once you get to work, you could think about walking or riding a bicycle to lunch instead of getting in your car and driving to lunch. And so there, there's things that I think we can do throughout our day that may not be necessarily a part of our, our main commute or whatever our main trip for the day is that that we can all um, adjust to. Mm -hmm. That's really helpful. Thanks. Thanks, Meg. What other questions do we have? Dustin, looks like you've got a question for us next. Yeah, I emailed a couple of questions earlier. Did those come through by any chance? It's okay. I can ask them now. If that's <laughs> I think Sydney's yes, got Go ahead those. and ask them, please. I'll ask it now. It's okay. Uh, right. So my first question was about the uh, the cats station that's planned at the airport with the Silver Line. And I don't know whether you have insight on this, but we were really disappointed to find that they – that the, the station was not going to be within an easy walk of the terminal. So lately, I live in South End, right near the Scaly Bark station. So 
we only have one car and don't use it often. But lately I've been experimenting with when I go to the airport, I'll take the, I'll walk to the train, I'll take the train to the transit center and I'll take the Sprinter bus to the airport. Uh, <laughs> Sprinter is a misnomer. That is not a fast bus. <laughs> I wish it was. But with the new, uh, so that's, that's one transfer. With the Silver Line, I'll actually have two transfers because I'll have to take the Blue Line to the Silver Line and then the Silver Line to a shuttle. So I'm wondering what that's going to look like in terms of how far will that be from the terminal and why weren't we able to place a higher priority on that, especially given that this is happening in conjunction with a total redesign of, of the the road network around the airport anyway why, why not just run it to the tunnel so that's a, a great question dustin and again i don't i don't work for cats so i i can't give you their exact answer but we did go to their uh their public information meeting that was just a few weeks ago and i would encourage you to check out their their website i believe that they have that i think that they have that that meeting content posted now the way that it was explained to us is that the the uh the passenger terminal is a small part of the airport and they had diagrams that were showing where uh, future mixed use development is being planned for the area between where the Silver Line station at the airport will be and the passenger terminal. And it was explained that the, the, the experience for passengers will begin essentially as soon as they get off of the Silver Line. So there, you know, there may even be like a baggage check area right there. Um, and, then, and then people will just get on a people mover. So it, it won't necessarily be a separate shuttle it will be in, an integrated, the way it was explained, there will be, it'll be an integrated experience from the time the passengers get off the silver line until they uh, arrive at, at the gates. Um, and, there, and the airport owns a lot of that land between the silver line station area and the passenger terminal. And there's currently not much there. I think it's just some parking lots. And so they see a huge amount of development opportunity in that area. So Charlotte is, for example, is one of the few airports, large airports in the country that doesn't have an on-site hotel. So that's something that could go there. There could be an apartment space. Um, so they're, they're not looking at putting any residential space in that mixed use development because of the noise from the airport, but they're really trying to, to take advantage of the development opportunity there while also providing a fast, uh, seamless transfer for people from the Silver Line to the passenger terminal. Okay, thanks, Meg. That's great. I have one more question. Can I can I ask that as well? Sure. So we use the Cast Pass app when we ride the light rail or when we ride the bus, and we didn't know until John Lewis, the Cat CEO, had told us at at a Grow Smart. Grow Smart event at Resident Culture that Sustain Charlotte put on. This was maybe a couple of years ago, year and a half ago. He said, oh, yeah, you can use the Cats Pass app for buses as well. It's the same 220 fare. And yet when we buy tickets on the Cats Pass app, they just say links, light rail tickets. Uh, we've been to a few other cities lately uh, who, and we always try to ride transit there, and they have much more streamlined systems. And we wonder, especially my girlfriend Jenna, who's here too, we wonder why Cats doesn't do a better job of branding the Cats Pass app is being for buses as well, because a lot more bus rides happen each day than train rides. And yet, especially uh, with Corona uh, virus now, we want as many touchless methods of payment as possible. So maybe Cat, do you have any idea whether there's a future in that with Cats advertising that better to make it clear to people they don't need to buy a bus ticket? Don't need I think hand. it's a fantastic uh rebranding re opportunity because I, as you were saying that, I just pulled up the, the CATS app on my phone and I see it does say, indeed say that the ticket that, that I have on there is a Lynx one day pass, but it's, it's also usable on the bus. And I ride the number 16 bus to work and I and people use the app um, on the bus, but probably not nearly as, as many could use it potentially. So I think that that's a, a great um, question. And uh, Tariq, who is our transit coalition coordinator, goes to all of the transit services advisory committee meetings. And that, that organization is a group of residents who have been appointed uh, to advise CATS on their day-to-day their -day operations and the experience for riders. So uh, I think that that would be a, a fantastic opportunity for Sustain Charlotte to continue to serve our role of connecting between government and and residents and transit riders 
so that that's something that that Tariq can bring up at a transit services advisory committee meeting. And I'd love to see that change made. And, and the second part of your question about the need for contactless or touchless payment uh, due to the coronavirus. So currently all of the CATS uh, vehicles, the, the bus and the light rail are free. Um, CATS, like many transit agencies across the country, they want to minimize interactions between bus riders and the drivers. So people now have to get on and off the bus through the back door and they want them to stay as far as possible away from the drivers. Um, now, as the situation starts to improve, but before there's a vaccine, we're hearing, you know, 12 to 18 months, um, yeah, I think there are people across, across society, um, not just with transit, but just the way that we pay for things in general, I think we're likely to see a strong shift towards contactless. And I, I hope that that's something that, that CATS is looking at. And we can also bring that to the Transit Services Advisory Committee's attention. So great ideas. And thank you so much. I know that, that you and Jenna are, are very sustainable in your lifestyle and you, you both of you work so hard to not drive. So thank you for that. I have a question here from Tina. Did Charlotte's economic mobility score improve much since that initial study when we were ranked last? Or is it too soon to measure any improvements since then? So that study, that was part of the, uh, le uh, sorry, equality of opportunity study that was done at Harvard back in 2014. Um, I would have to take a look at that and see if they've done a follow-up. I know that there's been a lot of research that has been, been done to try to understand those rankings and some of the factors that led to them. So for example, the study that found that commute time is the single strongest predictor of poverty was part of the follow-up to that. Uh, I don't know that they've gone back and re-ranked the cities, but they have been really trying hard to understand why those cities fell into that ranking in the first place. But we can take a look at that and see if Charlotte has been re-ranked since 2014, and we can let you know. Looks like we've got a question from John. Um, will COVID-19 lead to less dense growth in the near future? That's an interesting question. Uh, it's not something we that we've uh, really been exploring much as a society yet, given how uh, how quickly all of this has happened. I think one thing that that Charlotte, like many cities, is realizing is that when we do have dense growth, and there are so many, I, I just want to reiterate, there are so many benefits of dense growth. It's it allows us to be efficient with our space. It allows us to be more connected as people. Um, but you know, there's also the, the vulnerability of when you when you have something like COVID-19, it, it can spread more easily in a, a dense environment. Something that's that's really important is rethinking the way that we use our public space. And our streets are usually in most cities, our streets are our largest public, our largest shared par public space outside of parks. And most of our street space now is given over to cars. It's been really interesting to see now that people are driving so much less. It's, it's easier in many places to walk and bike because there's less vehicular traffic. Um, but, but people are now wondering how, as we recover, um, how are we all going to be able to still get to work and, and be able to walk along the sidewalks without being within six feet of each other. So different cities across the country have already started to build um, temporary bike lanes and in some cases reconfigure the street space. So for example, if they had two lanes of, of vehicular travel in either direction, they're at least temporarily uh, converting one of those for either walking or biking. So, um, you know, we're just at the very beginning of, of, of how that will shape out. I, I don't have a crystal ball <laughs> to know how it will pan out in Charlotte, but I, it definitely is something that, that needs um, urgent attention by our elected officials and our, our city and county staff. And it, I think it really will require the city and the county to work together because um, CATS and Charlotte DOT are on the city side, but then you've got Mecklenburg County Public Health on the, the county side. So it's, it's really gonna require um, cooperation like never before. Great question. Well, so we're, we're just about out of time and I, I wanna be sensitive to people's um, lunch breaks, but Thank you so much for um, joining us today. And we would love for you to follow us on social media and um, sign up for our newsletter if you don't already receive that. And then we will hopefully see you back here 
uh, either with your families or, or by yourself, uh, Wednesday, April 15th at the same time. And we're gonna learn how to explore nature in our own backyards. So thank you so much and have a great day. And, and look for that follow-up email tomorrow. We'll send you a link to the recording of this presentation and we'll also send you the transcript of the chat. Thanks. Thanks, Meg. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Have a good day. Good job, Meg. Mm-hmm. <laughs>